Well, my name is uh, Gerald Lawless, and uh, I'm involved with the ITIC, your host here this afternoon. So please don't go. We have a great panel coming up, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Where actually we're going to talk about how the Middle East is reinventing the financing of tourism projects. Mr. Gaetal Gay spoke very uh, interestingly about the financial side of running an airline and what we're looking to achieve uh, as uh, investors and indeed as operators within tourism, travel and hospitality within the region. So this afternoon, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, the panel, starting with Mr. Sandeep Walia, Chief Operating Officer for the Middle East for Marriott International. So Sandeep, if you'd like to come up and take a seat. If you just take the first seat, thanks, Sandeep. Next, we have Mr. Badr uh, Al Harbish, Executive Director of Strategy for the Tourism Development Fund of Saudi Arabia. And I'm sure we're going to be hearing an awful lot over today, tomorrow, and the day after about what Saudi Arabia is achieving for our industry and within the hospitality industry. Then we have uh, Laurent Voivenel, Senior Vice President, Operations and Development, Middle East and India for Swiss Bell Hotel, and also Group Director for HR. And finally, we have the founding partner of Eagle Wing Group, Mr. Denki Puri, with a long-term resident uh, here in Dubai, a gentleman I've known for some time. So I think, uh, Denki, yes, you can sit. Oh, you don't have a mic there. Sorry, Denki, you have to sit. Denki, you need to sit here, sorry. I was, otherwise, we won't hear you. My, my mistake, I'm really sorry. So, having briefed the panelists on what we might be able to discuss this afternoon to make it relevant, to make it interesting, and also to make it quite a dynamic session, I would very much uh, like to start by asking each of the panelists to briefly look at a number of areas. Just to summarize, we'd like to start by talking about the rising inflation, higher interest rates, labor shortages due to the nature of work, and of course the war in Ukraine. These are current issues that are actually affecting people's propensity to invest in our industry. And I would very much like to hear from each of the panelists, first of all to tell us a little bit about their own organization, and then we will start to address these issues. So if we can start with you, Sandy. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Sandy Bali, I'm the CEO for Marriott International. Um, Marriott, we just celebrated recently our 8,000th hotel globally. Uh, and in the Middle East, coming down to where we are today, we have 100, over 190 hotels with about 100 projects. Um, you spoke about a few things happening, and, and interestingly, all these things together are leading to a few trends in, in the industry, and maybe I'll just pick on three before I, I hand over the mic to bother. But I think the first one is clearly what we're seeing is, um, I think we also heard it from the previous panelists that uh, there is a pent up demand and I think there is no doubt about it. Uh, there is no doubt about the fact that business always had three kind of pillars. One was leisure, uh, business and groups. Uh, and of course, during the COVID times, we saw kind of shutdown or a slowdown of, of almost all the pillars. But the first one, which has really come back very strongly is is leisure, very clearly. Um, the hotels, especially luxury and leisure, are doing well. Our properties on, on, the, on beach properties or hills or mountains are doing very well. People are taking out the time to actually connect with their families and spend time. Uh, they, they're trying to, with, with today's trend of kind of working from wherever you can, from home or from office, kind of bringing that together of bringing business and leisure tourism together. So all that is kind of leading to this whole leisure space coming first, and that's really, really done well for us. The second is business, and this often gets spoken about that, you know, is business travel uh, slowed down forever? It's, it certainly is coming back slower than leisure has, but I think this ATM is a prime example. If you look around uh, all the halls, I personally feel it's even more full than 2019. 
the excitement is much more. Um, there is certainly this whole energy about meeting in person. And, I, and I'm 100% convinced there is no substitute to meeting in person. So we have started this, started to see business travel come back as well to our hotels. Uh, not the same speed as leisure, but yes, it's coming back. And interestingly, groups are coming back too. Uh, if you look at markets like uh, Egypt with Cairo or Turkey or Jordan, for sure we are seeing groups come back. So um, I personally feel uh, the future of this industry is very bright. Uh, and and uh, the gentleman who was talking about Fly Dubai said the same, that there's a pent-up demand. I think we're seeing it in all the three pillars for sure. Thank you very much, Sandeep. And also, I think that representing Marriott, uh, it's very appropriate to mention that your great founder, or son of the original founder, Bill Marriott, recently retired. And what a wonderful gentleman he is. And what a great example he has given so many of us in the hospitality industry. Uh, I always remember him. Uh, he, he always says when he visits a hotel, he doesn't go in the front door. He actually goes in through the loading bay. Oh. And another great thing he taught me was, uh, you know, Gerald, he said, you have to say that after you talk, always ask the other person, what do you think? Sure. I think it was a great example. But I would like to say to Mr. Bill Mario, congratulations. It was really great. Thank you. Now, getting back to the business, it's interesting to hear you talk about uh, meetings coming, groups coming back. Do you see that applying as well on the, on the business side, the corporate side, to uh, incentive travel? Um, yes, the, the, the speed at which incentive groups are coming back might be slower than the leisure groups coming back right now. So if, right. you, if you had to go to travel with me to Cairo or you had to travel with me to Istanbul, you would find a lot of leisure travel tourism related groups. Um, incentives have just started smaller in number. We're seeing, in fact, smaller organizations or mid-sized organizations starting with business travel and incentive groups more than the large organizations. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's just a matter of time that, that that would catch up too. And presumably, pleasure, as they like to call it, will uh, be something where... Absolutely. Yeah. Pleasure or vocation, or however leisure. you call it. No, very good. Thank you very much, Sandeep. So, Mr. Bader, everybody is talking about Saudi Arabia. Everybody is excited about it in the industry, particularly in this part of the world. And I'm sure, you know, when you talk about pent-up demand, you can see how that has evolved not just since COVID, but actually since the visa, tourism visa, uh, be became part of what we now know of how to go to Saudi Arabia. So please tell us about what your foundation does, what your organization does in terms of facilitating, particularly investment, and maybe some examples of uh, what has already been delivered. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerard. And, uh, special greeting to all the attendees and a special thank you to the organizers of this wonderful venue. It's very good to be here. Um, uh, I'm the head of strategy of the Tourism Development Fund. We're part of the Saudi tourism ecosystem that is tasked with executing the national tourism strategy. We aim to activate the tourism sector in Saudi Arabia as this sector, of course, is one of the most promising uh, sectors globally when it comes to GDP contribution and jobs. One in every ten jobs uh, globally is a tourism related job and it's an untapped uh, sector in Saudi Arabia. We aim to activate it. We aim to reach a hundred million visitors annually by 2030, uh, have uh, the tourism sector contribute 10 percent to our national GDP and create a, a, million job, a million jobs between now and then. For the fund uh, specifically, so the ecosystem is comprised of three entities, the Tourism Development Fund, the Ministry of Tourism, and the Saudi uh, Tourism Authority. And collectively, we, we call each other a tourism ecosystem because we share these objectives and targets and we collaborate to facilitate uh, any requirement from the investment side or the tourism experience side, for, uh, whether, the, whether it's funding uh, solutions, uh, matchmaking, uh, licenses and permits, all the way to tourist experiences and obstacles, and uh, resolving the obstacles. Uh, the fund has a seed capital of $4 billion, uh, and we have, uh, we have been established just, uh, just under two years ago, and we're very proud to have you know, supported many, many investors, developers, and operators, many of whom are here today and are uh, close friends as a result. 
So which would you be your big example of uh, what we can all now begin to relate to uh, so for the near future? So there's many, many to name. We have, we have unlocked around $3 billion worth of projects, $3 billion uh, mm -hmm. worth of capital, and around $2 billion are from the private sector. Uh, so our main mandate is to support the private sector investors. We don't view investors, operators, and developers as clients. They are more strategic partners. Our real clients are uh, the local communities and the tourists. So we collaborate with these stakeholders to ensure that to develop win-win uh, solutions. We have a variety of financial solutions, but also we uh, equally important is the non-financial solution that we offer, whether it's facilitating with all the facilitating all the needs of the investor or developer operator within the local stakeholders, whether it's government or private, filling in the pieces of the puzzle that brings everything together into a successful uh, partnership and project. And uh, just recently we have signed, I mean, aside from the three billion that has already been committed, we have signed an MOU with Deutsche Hospitality uh, to establish the first uh, Porsche design hotel in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia. We have signed an, uh, an agreement with uh, NS Moore to establish a $400 million, uh, a 400 million uh, dollar fund to ex execute 10 lifestyle destinations across 10 destinations within Saudi, and there's many more uh, to follow. And uh, the question is nowadays, where are you going to get all the people from to run this business? Is this a, a major side of your development? That is absolutely not a problem, and that is evident by the huge demand that's, that we have seen so far, and we have not even scratched the surface of what's, what's possible in terms of potential. Uh, Saudi has uh, had already welcomed around 40 million annually due to the, uh, to the presence of Mecca and Medina due to Hajj and Umrah. We want to expand that, that strength and yeah. expertise into the leisure uh, arena. And Saudi Arabia offers a wide variety of uh, natural assets, whether it's we have two very long and beautiful coasts in the Red Sea and the Arabian Gulf. We have mountains, deserts, metropolitan cities. So all of these, a visitor would come and, and experience many different experiences and within a very convenient half an hour, one hour drive, complete change of scenery, change of weather, and change of experience. And really a new discovery for so many people. Fantastic, yeah. Mr. Pablo. Thank you very much. So I now go on to uh, Laurent, who will talk to us a little bit about uh, Swiss Bell Hotel. I believe it was, now, yes, yesterday I, I googled uh, Marriott and they said there are 7,000 7, hotels worldwide. And today it's already gone up to 8,000 hotels worldwide. So uh, I understand you're in the region of about 150 hotels? Yes, more or less. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Laurent Voivner, like Laurent Voivner, like my, like it says above. Um, I've been with Swiss Bell Hotel for the past uh, five and a half years, and I would like to say thank you to my chairman, Gavin. Thank you. This is the first trip that the chairman is doing for the past two and a half years because of COVID. Unfortunately for him, he's from New Zealand, and you know, except the cows and the ships over there, they close everything else. So he was not able to travel. So Gavin, thank you for coming Very to welcome. ATM. Thank you. Um, so yeah, compared to my uh, colleague uh, Sandeep over there, we are, we are a boutique firm hotel. We have 125 hotels operating and under construction over there. We should be able to pretty much double the size of the company by uh, 2030. And yes, we saw a, a good growth, obviously, not only in the regions, but globally. Um, just before coming on stage, actually, I was uh, having a little chat uh, with Badders. And, the, the system that they have put in place to help investors, um, owners, and operators to really develop and grow their business in Saudi Arabia is quite amazing. And uh, we already took a, an appointment, obviously, to discuss the future. The, what is important is, as Sandeep said earlier, we saw a very, very strong recovery. The leisure market was very strong. The group and mice are coming back. The corporate are coming back, but I will say, and we had that discussion with Sandeep a little bit earlier and with you, Gerald, um, the way that we are doing business and we see the recovery in the corporate is a little bit different than before. Um, we are all here today because we have a huge event, and thank you again for the organizer. But I must admit that before, when I had to do, get a meeting to an owner, I was taking the plane, going in the morning, coming back in the afternoon. That's over. 
So the corporate business is going to change. The answer is yes. To what extent? Honestly, I don't think that nobody knows. Our colleague from uh, Fly Dubai was saying that you know you cannot continue to have the price rising like they are because if it's not under control, we will not be doing. What we saw, however, is that the volumes of corporate business has reduced, but the length of stay has actually increased. So, for example, I'm traveling with my boss uh, next week. Uh, normally, I will have done uh, uh, one day here and come back here one day here. Actually, we are going to go for five days on the road. So it's one trip, five days. So the, 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 the way we are going to do business is different. The length of stay, what we have seen in our 120 hotels, have increase but the volumes of traffic has slightly reduced so nevertheless um, it could be exactly the trend if as uh, the gentleman from uh, fly dubai mentioned earlier if the price of oil is continue to rise and the inflation is not under control we definitely will see a reduction in traffic and especially in corporate business well i think one of the biggest worries and i've mentioned earlier has to be the situation with regards to inflation now, I know that it's nice to see the length of stay increasing in the hotels, but I don't think the airlines will be particularly keen <laughs> to have that model coming on too much because it will mean less flying. But I would be interested in something we can discuss a little later, but we can discuss just briefly now as well, is that how do you see the ongoing development of what we call yield management, dynamic pricing? I mean, we see, for example, this summer coming, a huge spike in, in, in airfares. Uh, you can certainly see it in hotels as well. Do you ever see that there might be a propensity from governments around the world to even consider going back to the bad old days that people my age would remember of the 1970s when there was price control? Or do you think that we will continue to encourage competition, thus keeping the prices down? Okay, that, that's a million dollar question. Then, you know, I was uh, talking to Sandeep when the gentleman from Lai Dubai was saying that dropping the rate uh, during the flight basically was not working. And I was saying, uh, Sandeep, uh, is he talking about airfare or room rate? You know, uh, and, and the reality is there. You know, dropping the price has never been a solution. Well, we, we learned in the hotel business yield management from the airlines, I think. <laughs> so hey, uh, Gerald, we know, I mean, I, I hope that I'm not going to insult everybody here, but, you know, the, the hoteliers are so how should I say, traditionalist, that basically, yeah, we are pretty much 10 years behind what the airline industry is doing. The yield management, we did that, you know, okay, 10 years after. So yeah. is the competition is good? The answer is yes. Uh, uh, as the gentleman also uh, said earlier, you know, we have one Dubai, but with Saudi coming up over there, and if we have five Dubai in the region with help, the answer is yes. Uh, will it be challenging? The answer is yes, because you mentioned about the manpower. Uh, manpower is an issue because we realize also that our industry is not attracting as many people as we need and that's definitely a problem that we'll face um, but nevertheless we need we know what is happening so we need to put and anticipate in order to put the measure you know in place before it happens and certainly with the cost of labor coming up as well with shortages I'm sure it's an issue so now we go on to my good friend Thinky Puri who uh, again has been in Dubai for many, many years, knows everything about investment in the travel, tourism and hospitality industry, extremely knowledgeable and very active. And I'm sorry if some of you can't see Dinky, is there, uh, otherwise you might, do you want to stand up at the podium, mister? Do, come up so people can see you. Otherwise we're hiding it from half the audience. So please Dinky, tell us a bit about your company, about yourself and uh, the issues that you have. Eagle Wing is a company that I co-founded with my partners. Our core business is hospitality and real estate related to hospitality. We also are JV partners of two hotel brands, one from Switzerland, one out of Indonesia, where we round about 220 hotels in Indonesia. And this part of the world, we have our own hotels. Over and above that, we asset manage and work with practically every brand uh, in the market uh, for, on behalf of owners. Talking of investment, uh, Gerald, I think from one of the points that you brought up, where, does, where, where do we look with the, is, is that, was one of your questions Please, you want yeah, me to answer that? Yeah. One of the questions that Gerald had for, for me was how do we see investments going forward with respect to what's been happening in the market? The answer regretfully is that there will be a slowdown. There will be an impact in the market. 
the cost of uh, operation, the cost of funding, uh, the cost of asset development is going to get impacted with what it is. And uh, they, you, what's going to really happen is there's going to be a demand supply balance at the moment uh, for the short term. So we got, we got to balance those. Those properties that at the moment are in different stages of construction need to be completed. Otherwise, inflation cost and cost of development is going to go up. And I think a development plans for, a, for short term will be impacted due to high level of inflation and costs going forward. The answer is that you've got to be cautious where you approach it, but hospitality and travel is one element which will always be there. You've got to, you've got to ride this uh, invisible giant which has faced you today, whereby lending costs are going to go up, development costs are going to go up, infrastructure costs and logistics are going to go up. So you are in for a short-term uh, pause in, ter uh, in terms of acceleration of projects. How then are you going to balance that with, for example, Mr. Bother talks about 10% you know, of GDP will come from the tourism industry in Saudi Arabia. It's already at that levels and above in many countries uh, around the region. So there's still that great desire and demand to build hotels, to develop the industry. Because I think what Mr. Brother talks about is correct. And where we come, and if I can put on my investment hat, we differentiate and cut to the chase of nation building versus actual sustainable projects. Now, you've got to do that. Saudi has an advantage that it's got a captive clientele, that there is an end consumer in Saudi, and there's a shortage at the moment of, act of asset classes. So there is a potential, and I think Saudi owes no oil reflected businesses. You want to grow. But what, when you grow at that scale, you've got to be cautious about ensuring that those projects that you're building are financially sustainable for the future. You, you can't only go and start developing iconic projects at the end of the day that take a long period of maturity to pay back. And that's where the caution and strategy needs to be recalibrated. Operators are in a rush to put a flag. You are there to build asset classes and induce them and encourage that. But where the differentiator comes in is short-term financial success, mid-term and long-term nation building. That is, these are the three differentiators. Thank you, Dinky. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dinky. That leads us in very succinctly and nicely, I think, to a question that I've had more for the hotel operators, and particularly Sandeep, is that we understand the business model of the huge operators like Marriott. And though they may have started by owning their hotels, they will proudly proclaim now, how many hotels do you own? 8,000. <laughs> owned? No. Own, no. Sorry, I thought you said how many hotels we have. No, we have very few owned and leased. And that also in, in Europe. In, in Middle East, none of the hotels are owned. No, but that's my question, is that from what uh, Dinky is saying, from the pressures that are there on all sides in terms of cost, in terms of potential slowdown, and we see sort of an evolution and development of a lot of uh, operators, management companies, actually even, even agreeing to uh, franchising. But do you see it ever going the other direction where actually they may be in a, in, in a position or need to in order to keep their expansion going to actually co-invest in uh, hotel operations? Sure. I mean, for us as Marriott, we are clearly an operator. Uh, we, we don't see moving away from a very asset light business. And, and it's just a business um, a particular company is in. Some, some are into hotel investments, some are hotel funds, uh, and some is, are into an operating business. And we as Marriott are into either operating as, or managing hotels or into franchising. So we particularly don't see ourselves moving or changing this asset light model. Um, what we have seen, of course, is that you know, with, with times there have been a few trends that have come in. So we kind of see, in fact, if I had to highlight three trends, one would be that we have started to see a lot of extended stay options. So it is clearly um, a focus that we need to partner with owners. We need to partner with Bader to see what are the kind of projects that will do well in Saudi Arabia or in other countries 
And while, yes, we will have leisure and luxury growing, and we do have, in fact, a few hotels in Saudi opening, uh, this, between this year and next year, we have the addition at the Formula One track, we have the St. Regis in Riyadh, we have the Ritz-Carlton and St. Regis at the Red Sea. But what we've really seen is another trend which has come in, which has started from UAE, actually, is extended stay. Uh, and that's something which we are seeing a lot with our ownership groups where a lot of people during COVID have moved out from their apartments or villas and moved into extended stay brands. Now, it could be in the luxury space, for example, with the Grosvenor House, or it could be the Marriott Executive Apartments, or it could be the Element in the economy scale. But more and more people are moving into extended stay, checking in, which are monthly rentals, and not having any kind of a pressure of uh, hygiene, cleanliness, monthly bills. Um, so that's a trend we have seen, and that we are partnering yeah. with different owners to do that. The second thing we have seen is a lot of branded residences. So just in the last quarter of this year, in Q1, we launched three branded residences in UAE itself. We've, in fact, launched the St. Regis residences by Imar. We did a Ritz-Carlton residences and W residences where you as, so this is the change in the business model to your, to your point. Neither are we investing, but we have owners who are investing, coming up with residences. The end consumer, that is you, who's looking at buying residences but wants that lifestyle, luxury, or that um, benefits that come with the brand, uh, that the branded residences and you're buying those residences. So it's an yeah. immediate flow of cash back to the owner, um, which, which is what they like to see as well. It's, it's a benefit for the end user like you who's buying those residences yeah. and for us who are managing it. Well, we certainly see that uh, when a developer, an investor, goes to a lender, the first question the lender asks is, well, which operator have you got? So yes. obviously there's a big advantage in that. Before I go to Mr. Father, I see Laurent here is really wants to say something, I think, about the whole model of management agreements and yeah. financing. Yeah. <laughs> Def definitely. What, what happened is that uh, obviously uh, Marriott has the modules over there, which is obviously quite different than the smaller operator. Um, however, uh, we, we don't really own assets. Uh, we have uh, four assets on, on in, uh, our lease. But what we are trying to do is that if, and, and we had the discussion with Bada actually just a few minutes ago before coming on stage, um, if an owner is facing some difficulties to finish the property, we, we try basically, we don't want to substitute ourselves to the bank because we don't have simply the cash flow to do that, but we are trying to find an investor who said, okay, would you be interesting, for example, to invest on the property or you take equity or we guarantee you a 6% return until you get your money back? The condition is we manage the property. And when I was uh, having that discussion with Val, I said, Laurent, hey, after the meeting, we, maybe you can discuss because we can help you. We, we are not uh, in the positions like maybe bigger operator have with the cash and say, hey, you have a property, you're missing $5 million to finish your property and the FF&E, um, we have already the management agreement, I help you. Some yes. big operator can do that. Some, some big operators are putting key money when they do a rebranding of the property. We, unfortunately, being a small boutique uh, firm, we, we, we cannot do that, but we try to assist the owners by finding the necessary capital that they need to finish the property. So you're, fa you're facilitating yep. the uh, development. Don't forget ITIC as well when you're doing uh, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I will come to you after that. Uh, don't worry about it. I know. So, Mr. Father, I'd love to hear more, a bit more about Saudi Arabia and what you do with regards to, I know you touched on it, with FDI, how you can bring, uh, bring business and bring finance and bring investment in from outside the kingdom. Absolutely, and as I mentioned, we are more than just a financial uh, provider, and that is usually the, the misconception about what is needed in the market, specifically for foreign investors. Uh, I think it all starts with the availability of the data. It all starts with the strategy of the kingdom, right? So with the Vision 2030 endorsed by His Royal Highness, the, the, the custodian of the Two Holy Mosque, and it draws out the vision of His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, that sets a clear direction for the kingdom. And then following that, you have the all the programs and specifically the quality of life program that, that kind of hosts all the 
tourism, sports, culture, entertainment within it, to anchor the tourism development in a way that is more, that gives back to the community, right? So that, that provides the sustainability factor that we are looking for as a fund. So just building on what Mr. Puri had mentioned, financial sustainability is, is our, one of our mandates. It's one of our responsibilities to the investors and developers and operators. We don't want to fund projects that ended up failing. We, that's not what we, we're not, you know, it's not a commercial transaction. It's a strategic partnership, as I said. Then following that, you have the availability of da data and facilitating all the necessary requirements within the kingdom, whether it's through, through our relationship with the private sector or uh, the government entities. And I can give a few examples of success stories that have already been uh, there. I mean, some of them are under construction as we speak. Uh, we had, um, we worked with, with uh, Sira, one of the listed companies in Saudi Arabia, to develop uh, a project in Al Baha. At that point, it was just an interest to develop a tourism project. The Tourism Development Fund took the lead, went to the, uh, collaborated with the private sector, with the landlords in Al Baha, and, uh, and whether it's private or uh, government, identified the best suitable lands for that investment, collaborated with the investor, of course, to select the right land, brought in the right developer, operator, facilitated all the necessary requirements to fulfill, to fulfill the requirements of actually winning that land for that project and everything has been smooth sailing afterwards. Of course, we will provide the necessary financial support, so the financial instruments uh, that is uh, most suitable for the project. Um, in TDF, we have several products under three main umbrellas, debt, equity, and guarantees. And we have supported more than 50 projects uh, in the past two years using these different tools. And we, we recognize the need to develop and continue to be proactive uh, to meet the needs and expectation of specifically the foreign investors. I mean, disruption, especially in the hospitality industry, is happening at a light speed. To be, I mean, uh, tourists are very demand. I mean, uh, as a tourist, I can tell you a quick story. For the first time, I've experienced dealing, and dealing with my hotel using an app. Uh, I don't have to wait and go back to the hotel to make a booking through my concierge or have them clean my room or do whatever. I can just do it right now on the app and it's completely worry free and now that becomes the standard whenever I travel personally so and things keep on moving in that direction and we need to be on our on our toes to ensure that we meet the, the financial and non-financial requirements and demands of our partners very much. thank you very much and also with the technology side and what you're doing and everything we're having a presentation later this afternoon from uh, mr. Mark Abraham of shackle who will allow you to do all of that including open the door to your room with your, uh, with your telephone, which we know the way technology is developing uh, within, the, within the business will continue very quickly. So when we look at the loyalty programs, and I'm sorry if it's a little bit hotel orientated, but it still goes through all the airlines and everything. We, we look at um, programs, loyalty programs like the Bonvoy, which is of course very well known. Um, how, how do you see that evolving? How do you see that being actually recognized as the asset that, that it is and how it can develop? And uh, I might start again with you, uh, Sandeep, on that. Sure. I'll come back to you in a minute, uh, Dinky, as well. Yeah. Is, that, is, is there value there? Are you going to have something out of this that in the, in the long term this would be a currency? And I know we have t uh, talked later about how to spend uh, your points, but I'm really interested to know how uh, the value uh, of the investment in Bonvoy and your loyalty programs will continue to evolve? I think um, for us, Marriott Bonvoy is, is um, the, in the heart of every, every brand that we have. It's almost like an umbrella. So we have today 30 brands. Um, and this, the Marriott Bonvoy is an umbrella to the whole, all the 30 brands, or is in the, is in the center of all these brands. Uh, we today have about 160 million members globally. Um, and there was a particular time when we kind of tried to measure, and it was almost sign up of a million members pre-COVID uh, to this program. Now, this clearly indicates that loyalty is here to stay and grow. And you're absolutely right that it is almost like a currency. But it is a physical and an emotional currency, and I'll explain. 
um, physical because, yes, you are staying in our hotels, in our resorts, um, in the different brands, and you're earning points which, which kind of stay with you and you can use it for either redemption or upgrades or you can use it almost like a currency because you can even uh, move your points into miles, into skyward miles and take a flight. So it's almost like a currency. But I think there's a em strong emotional part to this as well. And that is the fact that it's not only about earning and redeeming points, it's also about experiences. And this is something which we always had started to see during pre-COVID. Um, I wish I could say post-COVID, it continues, but uh, when we're almost getting over it. But pre-COVID, we had started to see a lot of product changing into experiences. More and more people, instead of buying something, were going and traveling and experiencing something. So for us, Marriott Bonvoy is part of that journey as well. It's part of the journey where uh, you can use these points to, to have experiences. You could be going for the next um, Formula One uh, games using your points. You could be going in for a football game, but not only going for the game and just sitting on a regular seat, but having that experience to go behind the scene, uh, to go and, and see the, the, the races happening from the inside or the preparation of the games uh, and all that getting used or you're using those points, which is more experiential. Um, so I think that, that really is more the experiential part of it. So it's, yes, it's a currency, more physical and, and experiential as well. But I'll also add that it is a loyalty program. It's, it's beyond a currency as well. Uh, we all know today that even a traveler who's, who's sitting in the first class um, or in the business class is also when he or she is landing looking at, at the app and saying, did I get my points? Uh, and it's becoming more and more people are connected to it. So it is a loyalty program where once you've signed in, for example, to Marriott Bonvoy, we feel the loyalty is increasing. If there's a choice for the guest to come and stay at a particular city with one of our hotels, if he or she is a Marriott Bonvoy member, it automatically becomes the first choice to stay. And we are able to reward it because that particular guest might be a gold, a platinum, an ambassador, and for us, they become even more valuable guests or customers because they end up spending more with us when they are a platinum or ambassador guest. And presumably also it's important for the investor to be able to see that uh, you know, the, the value to the investor is important as far as the, is it a currency, is it not? Do I have to give the room for nothing or do I have to give the seat for nothing? So I'm very interested to see how you're going to develop with say Expedia and the various OTAs and aggregators when they do their own loyalty programs. Do you see that cutting across what you've um, invested in? Yes and no. Uh, I, I, I think OTAs are here to stay and we are here to partner with them and work together. But when we look at a loyalty program like Marriott Bonvoy, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll give that answer in two, two, in two points. One is your first point where if for an owner who's investing in a Marriott hotel, he's actually or she's actually getting 160 loyal Marriott guests suddenly as a engine behind um, that owner investing in that particular hotel. So I think it's a clear win for any owner to be connecting with uh, a program like Marriott Bonvoy. Um, go ahead, you wanna say something? No, I'm not going to ask you another question. I gotta to go to Dinky if I can, because I know that I'm running out of time. So sorry, sure, sure, Sandy. please. But um, we were saying, where will the disruptors come from now in the industry, Dinky? You? You've had time to think about this. You're a bit of a disruptor yourself. So tell us. It's working. I think disruptions really will come from those hotels that very highly depend on the OTAs, will come from select services properties at the end of the day. And the challenges in this are going to be uh, cost of travel. The air ticket pricing, as much as people don't want, uh, we've seen costs going up, especially with the major carriers who are bringing in the load. You're seeing inf uh, cost of living going up. You're seeing cost of payroll going up. You're seeing regulatory requirements and the mandatory uh, services that require costs again going up. So these are key issues that are going to impact the entire value proposition going forward. And we've, whilst we are focusing and growing on a recovery and keeping the industry low, we've got to be able to also sustain the cost structures in relationship to revenue. 
and their, the segmentation of inventory and, and asset class in the market are going to disrupt the general flow, or, which, are, uh, which are eventually going to take a final ticket price on a traveler. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senki. And um, we'll come back to you in, in a few seconds. But I'd like to ask uh, Laurent, it's a different topic now, but also very important, I think, for investment, is where is climate change and sustainability taking us, not just in aviation, uh, but in total investment for travel and tourism? I find it very disconcerting where we so often see that uh, when even media advertise, what are we doing about sustainability, they'll show an aircraft. Yet aviation only contributes 2.7% of carbon emissions worldwide. In the hotel industry, I don't think we've always been so great, particularly since uh, COVID, where we've gone backwards on single-use plastic. But how would you see sustainability, climate change? Where are the challenges? Where are the opportunities in relation to investment in our, in our business? I believe that it's certainly one of the most important things that we are going to see in the future. According to the recent survey, we know that basically I'm a baby boomer, the only one, <laughs> and you know, we, we will be out of job in a few years. Basically, like uh, Joel and I will just basically uh, enjoy the beach. We will be, be replaced by the millennium. 75% of the corporate travel by 2030 will be done by the millennium. Believe it or not, the latest survey which was showing was that the, the choice of a hotel by the millennium, one of the five most cri important criteria was sustainability. So if we, as an organization, we want to keep our business, we want to keep our market share, and we want to attract these new travelers, we better to be very careful and listen to them. Very often, very often, and you know, we hotelier, we are looking our belly and say, well, we are doing good. And very often, we just simply to forget to ask how we are doing. Now things obviously have changed. We have review pros. We have a lot of things over there, a lot of surveys. A lot of data are collected. And we are listening to the customers even more than, than before. But sustainability, vital, absolutely vital. We are developing at the moment the numbers of a product, for example, brand, which I cannot mention here. Uh, one, potentially, I can mention that. It's called Maua. It's a five-star luxury brand, and it's all on environmental and sustainability. We opened our first properties in Bali, and we are looking at a few other properties in Africa, which are absolutely matching you know, the environment. Um, and not only because we want to keep the market share, it's also, uh, you know, we, we want to give to a legacy something maybe a little bit better than we found. Yeah. And I must admit that, you know, for the past 25 years, we have not done a very good job. Um, you know, we are talking about the pollutions of the uh, airline industry. Okay, I'm sorry if we have some people. Uh, uh, yeah, what about the cruise ship? You know, so we need to look at globally. Um, yesterday in BBC News, they was mentioning that if we don't pay attention, the global warming, which actually could increase from up to 1.5 degrees, 1.5 degrees. Imagine what it does represent yeah, for some of the countries. You're, you're, you're talking about 30 to 40 countries which could suddenly disappeared because of the, 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 the rising of the water. So we, we have to be careful and, yeah, for the society and for the legacy, yes, we need to do something and, and work on it, though no doubt about it. Well, and I, I guess that uh, sustainability is good housekeeping as well, from the point of view that actually it can be cost effective yes. in terms Indeed. of how we do things. But I think also that sustainability needs to in, look at the social side of the equation particularly in the amount of jobs that are created by our industry for young people to come into the industry. And I would think that that's a really important area also, Mr. Father, for governments to give incentives. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. If you go through the national tourism strategy, the, I mean, the underlying principles of why we're activating the sector is the social responsibility, is providing jobs in all destinations within Saudi. And 
uh, it's a huge boost to our economy and we recognize that. Uh, just to comment on what Mr. Ghaith and you had uh, repeated, the region as a whole would benefit, as you said, from five Dubais. I, I mean, I agree with the sentiment, but I disagree with the language. We don't need five Dubais. We, there's only one Dubai. We need Dubai, we need Riyadh, Jeddah, Al Ula, each with its own unique value proposition. And we have a very um, interesting uh, advantage when it comes to sustainability, as many of these destinations are green fields. So we are at TDF and as a tourism ecosystem at large, extremely interested to develop these in the right way and the right way to develop them is uh, in, in a sustainable manner. At TDF, we had just started revising our strategy and redeveloping it to integrate ESG within it. And within a few months, hopefully we will be done with that exercise to ensure to, that we encourage and provide the right incentives and programs and whatever type of support Excellent. to ensure the sustainable development and uh, maximizing the value for the local communities when it yeah. comes to jobs, when it comes to uh, the supply chain to the properties that we are supporting. Thank you so much. Well, we have run out of time. For me, it's been a really, really interesting conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it. I would ask each of the panelists Give us 30 seconds take. And I'll start with, with Dinky this time. So Dinky, 30 seconds, what do you want to say? Well, you know, first of all, I want to congratulate you, brother. And uh, generally at large, we've been operating at Saudi for a few years now. And I am excited to see the youths and the, in Saudi and the way they think. And they bring about a, a change in business thinking. They've educa they're educated. They've got a customer base, they're aspirational, and I think what I like when we do contract management and we talk of development Saudi, they are challenging the old way of thinking and are looking at profitability, are looking at what next for the next generation. So answer is, in the region, we have talent, we got hunger, we got opportunity, and the best part is the local population, the local youth, the children of the soil are thinking different. Congratulations, and go for it now. Thank make, you, thank you. Make it sustainable. Thank you. And Laurel? Well, I, I will not talk about Saudi Arabia because obviously Puri already did it, but for me, I'm, I will just be looking at you know, where we are today uh, globally. What do we represent in the world? Today, you have plus minus 2.4 billion people who can afford to travel. Okay, that's a good number. And every single operator is going after the, the 2.4 billion. We, because maybe we are small and we can afford basically to take a little bit more time, we, uh, we look at and say, okay, well, look at 2050. By 2050, you will have 4.8 billion people which will be able to travel. 2.4 billion more than what we have today. How are we going to basically tackle these people? How can we attract these people? So instead of looking after you know, the pie and try to bite each other, uh, you know, I must admit that with Mr. Gavin, we're always looking and said, okay, how can we attract the 2.4 billion? It's like, you know, like Sanjeev, Sandeep was uh, talking about the loyalty program, the bond voice, and it's the best loyalty program in the world. No doubt about it, you know, and uh, you know, I was the next Starwood guy, so I know what I'm talking about. Um, but, uh, and I'm glad that, for example, the OTAs are coming in the business because yeah. the OTAs are the only one who really can fight with these guys. We, we are nothing. We don't have a loyalty program. We have a benefit program. So that means that when you enroll in the program, you immediately get the benefit. You don't have to get punked. When you enroll, you get the benefit. You get 25, 20%, 25, 30, 35, but it's immediate because we realize also that the people don't want to wait anymore. When they want to buy something, they want to get it now. And as we cannot afford to wait, because we don't have the financial resources that Marriott has, we have to do something today in order to make sure that they get it immediately. So yes, for the benefit immediate, but when it comes to the future, we are looking at the 2.4 billion traveler coming up on the market within the next 20 years. Thank you very much, Lauren. Mr. Bader? Yeah, no, um, I'd like to conclude by thanking you, Gerard, my fellow panelists and the audience. And I guess I need to put a call to action. If to learn more about TDF, please feel free to visit our website, our social media presence. We are very keen to be your uh, success partner when it comes to development in Saudi Arabia, whether it's large, medium, small, or 
uh, startups, local and international. We are open for business, and we're more than happy to help. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I think thank my you. 30 seconds would be focused on people. Um, we, we, as Marriott, are 30 brands, but we don't own hotels, as we spoke earlier. I think for us, all we own is brands, and it's our people who bring these brands to life. So for me um, and our company, the most important is people and our culture. So if I had these 30 seconds, I'll just use this opportunity to thank all the Marriott Associates who make this hotel brand what it is today. So thank you to the people of the company. Well, I think that's an excellent way to finish, Sandeep. When you think about it, we are a business that relies on people. We're a business that relies on our customers. And who speaks to our customers more than anybody else is probably our most junior people in the organization. And really, as we say in the WTTC, as uh, Dr. Taleb Rifai has said many times in the UNWTO, travel and tourism is a force for good, and we've got to make sure that we keep it that way. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your thank great you. insights. We really you. appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.